such an honor for us here at NYU to have the opportunity to host um, this incredibly distinguished panel of, of thinkers and of leaders who are really working to bring an understanding of this idea of inter interdependence and of uh, a more sustainable future into our, our everyday lives. Uh, my name is Jeremy Friedman. I'm the manager for the sustainability office here at NYU. And uh, we and uh, the environmental studies program um, are honored to welcome Demos and the other organizations and this, this group of panelists to um, share their thoughts with all of us today. Um, interdependence um, is something that we're celebrating during this, this, this time in this series, um, which involves such um, a range of interesting events. Um, but it isn't something that only happens for one day or one week or one month. It's not something that we, we think about and then, and then shelve. By embracing these ideas, we've had an opportunity at NYU to play a role in the future and in the destiny of New York City. Since 2007, uh, NYU has, through um, an all-hands-on-deck approach that includes the top-down leadership and administrative uh, leadership, as well as a, a grassroots level of participation from every student, every faculty member, every staff person on campus, we've been able to reduce our campus-wide energy use by more than 30 percent in just over four years. Um, and that's without counting the 13.5 megawatt cogeneration power plant, which we uh, completed this year, which will further reduce our greenhouse gas emissions well beyond that threshold to a level closing in on about 40% or more. Uh, interdependence is a principle which we are experiencing every day. It's something we're living, something we're teaching, something we're working in our daily lives, and something that we're learning from. Some of you, I imagine many of you saw the op-ed in the Washington Post, which uh, Bill McKibben wrote. Um, some wonderful folks put together a short video, which uh, I think brings that, um, the ideas in that, in that piece directly into focus. Is this somehow related to the tornado outbreak three weeks before it in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or the enormous outbreak a couple weeks before that, which together comprised the most active April for tornadoes in U.S. history? No, that doesn't mean anything. It is far better to think of these as isolated, unpredictable, discrete events. It is not advisable to try to connect them in your mind with, say, the fires burning across Texas. Fires that have burned more of America at this point this year than any wildfires have in previous years. Texas and adjoining parts of Oklahoma and New Mexico are drier than they've ever been. The drought is worse than that of the Dust Bowl, but do not wonder if they're somehow connected. If you did wonder, you see, you would also have to wonder about whether this year's record snowfalls and rainfalls across the Midwest, resulting in record flooding along the Mississippi, could somehow be related. And then you might find your thoughts wandering to, oh, global warming, and to the fact that climatologists have been predicting for years that as we flood the atmosphere with carbon, we will also start both drying and flooding the planet, since warm air holds more water vapor than cold air. It's far smarter to repeat to yourself the comforting mantra that no single weather event can ever be directly tied to climate change. There have been tornadoes before, and floods. That's the important thing. Just be careful to make sure you don't let yourself wonder why all of these record-breaking events are happening in such proximity. That is, why there have been unprecedented mega-floods in Australia, New Zealand, and Pakistan in the past year. Why it's just now that the Arctic has melted for the first time in thousands of years. No, better to focus on the immediate causalities. Watch the videotape from the store cameras as the shells are blown over. Look at the news anchor man standing in his waders in the rising river as the water approaches his chest. Because if you asked yourself what it meant that the Amazon has just come through its second hundred year drought in the past five years, or that the pine forests across the western part of this continent have been obliterated by a beetle in the past decade, well, you might have to ask yourself other questions, such as, should President Obama really have just opened a huge swath of Wyoming to new coal mining? Should Secretary of State Hillary Clinton sign a permit this year allowing a huge new pipeline to carry oil from the tar sands of Alberta? You might also have to ask yourself, do we have a bigger problem than $4 a gallon gasoline? Better to join with the U.S. House of Representatives, which voted 240 to 184 this spring to defeat a resolution simply saying that climate change is occurring is caused largely by human activities and poses significant risks for public health and welfare. Propose your own physics, or ignore physics altogether. Just don't start asking yourself whether there might be some relation among last year's failed grain harvest from the Russian heat wave and Queensland's failed harvest from its record flood 
to France's and Germany's current drought-related crop failures and the death of the winter wheat crop in Texas and the inability of Midwestern farmers to get corn planted in their sodden fields. Surely the record food prices are just freak outliers, not signs of anything systemic. It's very important to stay calm. If you got upset about any of this, you might forget how important it is not to disrupt the record profits of our fossil fuel companies. If worst ever did come to worst, it's reassuring to remember what the U.S. Chamber of Commerce told the Environmental Protection Agency in a recent filing. That there's no need to worry because, quote, populations can acclimatize to warmer climates via a range of behavioral, physiological, and technological adaptations, unquote. I'm sure that's what the residents of Joplin are telling themselves today. Good evening. Just so you don't think that was a cry in the dark against people who don't really think the way that op-ed written by Bill McKibben suggested, I want to read you something written about the same time by Rush Limbo, who speaks not to the one or two million people who get the post and read it, but to about 25 million people a day on talk radio. When Mitt Romney a couple of weeks ago said again he actually thought there might be some connection between global warming and man-made contributions to the atmosphere of CO2 and other things, he said about Romney, bye-bye nomination, another one down. We're in the midst here of discovering that this is all a hoax. The last year has established that the whole premise of man-made global warming is a hoax. That went to about 25 million people who eat that up hungrily every day. So we're not talking here just about a straw man. We're talking about a real issue. My name is Benjamin Barber. I'm the founder of the Interdependence Movement. I'm at Demos, which is one of the uh, groups that's backing tonight. And I want to start by thanking uh, our friends here at NYU at the uh, uh, Sustainability Initiative, Jeremy Friedman, who you already heard from, Chris Slotman, who's the Associate Director of the Environmental Studies Program at NYU, and Zara Ali, the program coordinator. Thanks to them, we have this splendid room, and we have an opportunity to talk not just to our friends at Demos and at the Capital Institute, but also uh, to many others at NYU and uh, the New York community. So thank you so much. I also want to thank uh, our staff, Patrick Inglis and Harry Merritt, who made this possible uh, and who coordinated with NYU. NYU. It was actually Patrick who is teaching a course here right now, I think, who made the original connection for us. So we're very grateful to him. This is an exciting evening uh, for me and for, I think, all of us here. I, I've already introduced myself, and you'll hear more about each of the people here. But uh, let me just say quickly that we are being joined by Bill McKibben, uh, by uh, Graciela Cincioniski from Brazil and from Columbia University, and from my good friend and colleague John Fullerton, the founder of the Capital Institute. And I'll introduce him at a little more length in a minute. And what we're hoping to do uh, this evening is not just talk about sustainability, about finance capital and the problems it presents, about the banking and economic sector, and about ecology and the environment, but actually put the principle of interdependence to work, not just by talking about interdependence among nations and among societies, but the necessary and so much neglected interdependence among these siloed academic fields. And for those of you who are students, you know you have to choose a major. OK, I'm going into economics. I'm going into political science. I'm going into humanities, German, environmental science, as if they existed in silos, and as if you could spend four years studying one, go out and practice it without any reference to what happens in the other silos. And when John and I first met six, eight months, maybe a year ago, uh, at uh, a, a, another event at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, we started talking. And we realized that though he came from the world of finance, and he was a practical person with a long and successful history in the investment field, and I was a political philosopher and an academic, that we shared a great deal in common, that we brought different vocabularies, different set of issues to the field. And we talked then 
it was about a year ago, I yeah, guess, yeah. about trying to find a way to do some events together in which we could speak interdependently and across our own silos to uh, these issues. And I must say, I don't think either of us thought at the time we would have the good fortune of finding for this exercise two such extraordinary figures as uh, are joining us tonight to talk with us. The reason we have made interdependence so central, and I'm so glad that Jeremy and the initiative here are taking interdependence seriously, is that as we look at the world we live in, there's a stark and startling and really puzzling dilemma that we face. Almost every issue, you can name it, environment, banking, the pandemics that afflict us today, terrorism, technology, climate change, immigration, trade, the movement of capital, the movement of resources, are in their character cross-border and interdependent. That's just a reality. The brute fact of our world is interdependence in every one of the issues that we face. Yet when we come to respond to them, we respond with 17th century institutions called sovereign states that stop at their borders, don't cross their borders, insist on their sovereignty, and spend much more time insisting on that sovereignty than trying to cooperate with one another since that cooperation could impede or impugn the sovereignty. That's what happened in Kyoto. That's what happens over and over again when we come together to try to deal with these things. So we have a cruel asymmetry in this 21st century, a brute reality that's interdependent institutions, political, civic, and economic, that are independent, still celebrating the great declaration of independence, which in its time made a great deal of sense, because in the 17th and 18th century, if you wanted to secure liberty and security for all, you needed, first of all, an independent sovereign states with borders around it that you could defend. And inside those borders, you kept people free and safe. And for 300 years, that's been the goal of most societies. And even today, there are still societies fighting for their independence. And yet, in the 21st century, that independence is counterproductive, absurd doesn't begin to respond to the problems we face. So at the Interdependence Movement, and you can get it at interdependencemovement.org, we have now for eight or nine years, each year on September 12th, the day after September 11th, celebrating a day of interdependence in which we bring together young people, political people, religious leaders, cultural and artistic leaders in a day of celebration. We've been in Rome, Paris, We've been in Casablanca, in Brussels, in Mexico City, in Istanbul, last year in Berlin, and this year on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, we're gonna be in New York on September 11th and 12th. September 11th, as you know, will be the memorial, the 10th anniversary memorial for that terrible day 10 years ago when the United States learned the brute facts of interdependence when a malevolent NGO called Al-Qaeda that was quartered in no particular country, took its vengeance out on the United States. But since that time, we've constantly on September 11th looked back. We've created a nationalist war on terrorism and invaded a number of countries on the way to trying to eliminate an adversary that knows no country. And thus, on September 12th, we hope here in New York, even as we look back and memorialize the great losses of that terrible day 10 years ago, to look ahead at alternatives to a war on terrorism, at alternatives to invading still another country, at alternatives to sovereign remedies to transnational cross-border problems. So that's, that's the idea of interdependence, and that's what we do, and there's a lot of literature on it here. And it was in that spirit that we conceived, that John and I conceived uh, this idea this evening, and you'll see in the marvelous piece uh, that is, I think, in all of your chairs that he wrote uh, coming off of uh, that piece in uh, uh, the uh, FT in the Financial Economist. Yeah. Economist. Economist. That, that he wrote a piece that ends with an appeal to the realities uh, and the necessity of interdependence. We've already got interdependence as a destructive and brutal reality. What we need is interdependence as a prescriptive and constructive civic and political and economic reality to respond to all of those problems. And that's, that's the context and the framing 
for our debate this evening. But if we just talked at that level, it would be very, very abstract. And what John and I talked about doing was finding a way to bring a couple of the world's leading thinkers and activists on questions of environment, on questions of financial capital and the economy together to talk about their perspectives, but also to try with us to find some common ground among our perspectives, to find a kind of interdependent approach to the way each of us do the work uh, that we do. So uh, what, I'd, uh, what, what I want to do now then is introduce my friend and colleague, uh, John Fullerton, who's the founder and president of the Capital Institute. This is coming from a former managing director of J.P. Morgan. Capital Institute provides a collaborative space to explore and affect economic transition to a more just, resilient, and sustainable way of living on this earth through the transformation of finance. It's my own belief that only when many more people in the financial and banking industries and in Congress and in politics understand the things that Bill has come to understand and now spends his time working on, that John is now working on at the Capital Institute, will we begin to make progress on issues of interdependence. So I'm very, very happy to be here with John Fullerton this evening, and I want to introduce him now to come up and uh, say some words about both what he's doing and about Graciola. Uh, I've come to the conclusion after spending literally years uh, reading, studying, thinking about this problem that finance actually is not only a root cause, but also a tremendous opportunity for a solution. And so I'm, I've committed my, the rest of my life really to, to this work. And what I would start by saying is that I, I believe finance is a leading indicator. And what I mean by that is, um, just a, as an example, I was in Tokyo back in the uh, mid-1980s uh, when derivatives just started in Japan. And the, the notion of globalization was all in the air. And I learned about globalization because it meant I needed to stay up and answer the phone at night when New York wanted to do transactions with Japanese counterparties or in Japanese yen. And so, um, not to use that same word again, but we used to talk, walk around saying globalization sucks uh, because it meant we didn't get to sleep. The reality is that globalization then followed into the um, uh, com commercial markets and not that commercial markets hadn't been globalized before, but this whole globalization wave really started in finance. You know, we had our own dedicated networks long before the, the, um, you know, the World Wide Web existed in order to uh, run a globalized financial system. Um, and I believe the recent events in finance are also a leading indicator, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so first let me, so, so there's a lesson to be learned, in other words, from, from understanding and studying finance. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about our work. Uh, the description of it is, is, is somewhat abstract, but really our work starts with an observation that exponential economic growth, and when I say economic growth, I really mean material throughput growth, is in conflict with the reality of a finite planet and the laws of thermodynamics. A full world, as we now live in, in the Anthropocene, is fundamentally different than anything that humanity has experienced in the history of civilization. That's a big deal. We have also learned from system scientists and teachers like Bill uh, that, economic system, that the economic system is an integral part of a larger whole called the biosphere. There is no such thing as externalities, which we in economics and finance have grown very accustomed to talking about in a full world. In a non-full world, we can talk about externalities. So our work is centered on the intersection of sustainability and finance in particular. And my idea is that finance is the fuel source of an economic system and therefore a critical intervention point if we want to change the system. The challenge of achie achieving a truly sustainable economy is the great work of our lifetimes. And the practice of finance, and indeed our understanding of money itself, will have a huge impact on, this on the outcome. In fact, I would argue that our consciousness around money and the purpose of capital is at the very heart of the matter. I'd like to introduce just one idea here today that we find very helpful at the Capital Institute to understand the challenge of economic system transition and how we got where we are. It's a, it's a definition, the definition of sustainability. And it's a definition from natural system science, not from CEOs and not from what we learned in business schools. Sustainability is the point of balance between efficiency and resiliency. It turns out that natural systems err on the resiliency side. Yet economics and finance are about optimizing efficiency. 
labor productivity, capital productivity, just-in-time inventories, return on equity, modern portfolio theories, efficient frontier. These are all efficiency concepts. The virtual collapse of the financial system in 2008 teaches us about more than greed and bad bankers, although obviously we've learned a lot about that as well. It teaches us what happens when complex systems get too brittle and collapse. And I go back to my opening comment, finance is a leading indicator. Our challenge is to learn from that crisis not only how to make the financial system more resilient, but that the financial system is connected to the economic system, which in turn is an integral part of the biosphere now, now that we live in the Anthropocene, if I pronounce that correct. What, that is what this conversation tonight is about, the interdependence of the financial system, the economic system, and the biosphere. And given this interdependence, what does a sustainable economy really mean? So before I introduce um, uh, our distinguished economist here tonight, I'd like to uh, read you a quote that I often open up my own slideshow talks with, which pretty much sums it up. Uh, this was stated by Kenneth Boulding, who's an economist. He happens to be a Quaker. Uh, and he was the co-founder of general systems theory. And in case you didn't catch it, I've become a, a huge um, student of system science in this process. And I think, I tell my kids, if you're going to study one thing, learn about systems. And of course, when you study ecology, you learn about systems. Uh, Kenneth said this probably in the 60s. I'm sure Bill has heard this quote. I'm sure everyone up here has probably heard this quote. Uh, it might even have been the 50s. And what he said is, anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a, ma a madman or an economist. <laughs> And with that, I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished economist, <laughs> who I'm pleased to say is, is also now a friend and a colleague, and I'm privileged to be able to say that. Um, and you know, I, I normally don't like to read long resumes, but this one is truly worth reading, and this is only half of it. So bear with me for a moment. Um, it's a real treat that we have Graciela here this evening, and, uh, and I need to tell you a bit about her, her work. Uh, Graciela Chichilinski is one of the lead architects of the Kyoto Protocol, which set binding targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. She's a professor of economics and mathematics at Columbia University. Uh, it doesn't say this, but she has two PhDs, one in economics and one in mathematics. She's also a director of the Columbia's uh, Consortium for Risk Management. She acted as a lead author of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which received the 2007 Nobel Prize for their work in this area. In 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was signed by 163 nations, Dr. Chichilinski authored the protocol language that led to the creation of the carbon market. Graciela also created the concept of basic needs voted by 153 nations at the 93 UN Earth Summit to be the cornerstone of sustainable development, and in 96 created the formal theory of sustainable development that is, issued, that is used now worldwide. She's a special advisor to several UN organizations, heads of state, and her pioneering work uses innovative market mechanisms to reduce carbon emissions, conserve biodiversity, and ecosystem services, and improve the lot of the poor. She appeared in 2009 Time Magazine's Heroes of the Environment. Uh, Graciela is also the founder and managing director of an innovative uh, green technology company called Global Thermostat. But most importantly, Graciela is on the advisory board of the Capital Institute. And I'm pleased and privileged to call her my colleague on one of the more ambitious projects that we have underway right now. And with no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Graciela. <laughs> Who, by the way, is from Argentina. It's a real pleasure being here today. Um, I will tell you a little bit, following that wonderful introduction and what we heard before, I will tell you a little bit of a brief history of Western economics and how an individualistic frontier society grows interconnections or interdependence and the global commons. That is what I'm going to talk about very quickly. All of this in nine slides. <laughs> so Western, mar Western market economics 
I mean, remember, the Western civilization, so-called, we're looking at the relatively short-lived culture compared to others uh, in you know, Oriental cultures, for example. But the Western market economics, as successful as it is, is based on competitive markets, optimal growth theory, cost-benefit analysis, and financial models. The competitive market is individualistic. By that, it's meant that there is no connection between people. There may be connection at the end of the day, but everybody is optimizing what they want, what they care about, and that's it. Everybody looks after themselves. That is the definition of competitive markets, and this is for firms and for people. Optimal growth theory, you already heard it from John, is about exponentially growing population and resource use. A frontier society with no limits on the use of resources, and therefore no connection with real ecological systems. If you look at cost-benefit analysis that we use all the time to make economic decisions, how much will this cost me and how much can I get from it to make a decision, and this by definition and by law is used in Congress to make decisions about budgets, and if you, make, if you look carefully at financial models, they all discount the future. Financial models are about transactions, and typically transactions across time and in different states of nature. That's what they are. But they discount the future. Discounting the future means a dollar tomorrow is worth less than a dollar today, substantially less. And by this method, we introduce a short-term vision. And this short-term vision creates a cut, no connection between the present and the future. In, with this, what I call the dictatorship of the present. And this is the foundation. These are, anybody who is an economist here knows these are the foundations of economics. Oh, wait. So therefore, in summary, Western economics lacks connections between people, lacks connections between the economy and the environment, or the resources, and lacks connections between generations. Sustainable development requires building connections. Why? Because humans now dominate the planet. Because for the first time in recorded history, we are bumping against boundaries following an area, an era of rapid globalization. Humans dominate the planet for the first time in recorded history. We change the planet's atmosphere, we change the bodies of water, and we change the complex web of species that makes life on Earth. Faced with this, we need to understand what our economies are doing to the environment and vice versa, because for the first time in history, we are now changing the home, the planet, which is our home, in all these ways, in every possible way. This, this new situation that humans dominate the planet for the first time ever, means natural resource limits. As we reach natural resource limits and environmental limits, we understand intuitively that the survival of humankind is at stake. We know it. For example, the connection between climate change and the disastrous or potentially catastrophic risks that we face. I'm very careful about the words. I said catastrophic risks. Nobody can say there is no catastrophic risks. I'm not predicting the future. I'm telling you there is a serious risk, Cat potentially catastrophic. Catastrophic in which sense? Catastrophic for human societies. Today, we have 25 million people, migrants, who were dis displaced sorry, for uh, uh, climate change reasons. And that number is supposed to be expanding enormously over the next few years. It's, it's huge. Therefore, we need to understand, develop, work, the connections with the ecology between people and with the future of our species, precisely what's missing in Western market economics.
just those three connections that they were saying are so important, I'm putting the finger, I tell you where they're lacking, and I'm telling you why we need them. The question then becomes, okay, what are we doing? Are we throwing the baby with the bathtub water? I'm not sure what's the baby and what's the bathtub. It just sounds right. And besides, you understand what I'm trying to say. Are we going to throw this fantastic body of intellectual work uh, in which many of us have been educated and is really what we think about when we think in economic terms, which is every day, every economic decision. Can Western economics adjust? Can markets become sustainable? Markets are at the core of the problem. So the first thing you would say, well, if markets are at the core of the problem, look elsewhere. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is markets are at the core of the problem. Without doing something about markets, you can't solve the problem. I'm saying if they are the problem, they have to become part of the solution. Can this be achieved? Well, yes, it can be achieved. And I didn't say it will be achieved, OK? Be careful with how I use the words. It can be achieved. I don't know if it will be achieved. It's a race against time. But it can be achieved. It's important. For example, in the connection between the present and the future, we can do cost-benefit analysis and optimal growth theory that do not discount the future. It is possible. It has been done. I do that. I've been doing that since the early 90s. There is other people too. I don't have an exclusivity on this, OK? Mm -hmm. I mean, I might have started before others, but let me tell you, we need all the resources we can get here. So yes, you can have new axiomatic foundations for decision theory, for how we manage risks, which is the foundations of finance, for choices over time, which is what Koopman's neoclassical theory set back in the, in the 50s, so that there is no discounting of the future. Instead, you treat equally the present and the future. We see what sustainable development is all about. Sustainable development is about satisfying the needs of the present without depriving the future from meeting its own needs. You are trying to be fair to the present and fair to the future. I call that equal treatment for future generations, and this connects the present and the future, leads to sustainable development, and yes, it can be done. And in fact, it has been done. Now, what do we have to say about markets? Well, I did say something slightly provocative. I asked you whether the market has to be thrown away, or can we somehow transform the market into an ally of sustainability? Well, it can be done, yes. Market economics can be made sus consistent with sustainable growth. I didn't say it will. And certainly, it isn't. Be careful how you use the terms. It is not consistent today. It can be made. And I don't know if it will be made. And even if it was made, I don't know whether we're going to do it in a time scale that matters because time is of the essence and we are just fooling around. Uh, but the markets themselves must change. Individualistic markets must evolve. They must evolve into a new type of market, one that I have worked on this now for many, many years, which are markets for public goods which are privately produced. This was not studied before. They are not your normal public goods. Public goods means goods, not that they are produced by the public, but they mean goods that we all access them in the same, they're available to all of us in the same quantity. Think of the George Washington Bridge. There's no larger bridge for you and smaller one for me. There's one bridge. Look at the armed forces. Look at the law and order. All of these are common public goods. They're public goods. And they're Typically, historically, they were produced by governments. And that's the way uh, Samuelson looked at it, learning from Lindell, learning from Bowen. Lindell was the first one, and he was an economist. But you know what? These public goods are not the same. We are looking now at public goods of the sort of the atmosphere concentration of CO2. 
which is the same for everybody in the planet because CO2 diffuses uniformly and stably over the whole atmosphere. So if I go outside here and I measure the concentration of CO2 outside this window, I don't have to go any further. I know it's the same thing in Beijing right now and in Madrid. That's the way this gas operates. So I am exposed to the same CO2 concentration than the Chinese and the Spanish, whether you like it or not. It's a physical fact. You're dealing there for the, this concentration of CO2 that you worry about, this physical property of the atmosphere, yes, it is public good. But it's privately produced. There is no government there producing the CO2. You produce it. Let me show you. There we go. I just produce CO2. <laughs> I drive my car. I heat my house. And then when we say the developing nations are a problem because there are so many people, etc., I'm telling you, and I tell people, that in the case of the developing nations, if you manage to convince all, every person in a developing nation to stop breathing, <laughs> not to contribute to this issue, you still cannot deal with the problem of climate change because the great majority of the emissions are right here in the rich nations. You can convince them to stop breathing, but you will not solve the problem unless you do something about the rich nations emissions. And the whole world is hostage. This is really very similar to the Cold War issues that we had last, uh, last in the last century. But there are markets that are slowly emerging to deal with this issue to deal with the new scarcities. The carbon market of the Kyoto Protocol that I designed and I wrote, as John said, into the protocol in 1997 does that. The sulfur dioxide markets in the Chicago Board of Trade, they do that. There are new markets emerging for water in Australia, elsewhere, they do that, and for biodiversity. They are all markets for privately produced public goods. These new global markets value privately produced public goods in a way that were not valued before. They give value. They produce new measures of GDP. They value the global commons. And these new markets change capitalism. Because the markets that are trading privately produced public goods are sufficiently new that despite anything you have heard, they combine equity and efficiency. So the issues that the Capital Institute is concerned about, that includes these two issues, are combined. They, can, they cannot be separated into these markets. While in markets with private goods, they have no connection with each other. Therefore, these markets connect people. They require limits on resource use, because otherwise you cannot even start having one of these markets unless you say how much of the biodiversity you can use, how much carbon you can emit, as in the Kyoto Protocol, how much SO2 the power plant can emit. Unless you have those limits, you cannot even start the market. So they start from the limits. Therefore, connecting economics with the ecological systems, with the resources. So as you see, I just told you, how through the introduction of these new forms of no discount cost-benefit analysis, financial models, and now new types of markets, you can deal with the issue of connectivity. Older cultures understand that we are all connected. Our culture started a little bit limited. We started very individualistic. But you know what? We are getting there fast. It's being thrust in our eyes. Now economics as a science has to evolve. Yes, it's possible. And it's very interesting. And it's the tail that wags the dog. Because we shouldn't ask whether economics can do it. We should ask, can we do the economics that will do it? Because we have to do it. So the old economics from the last century is great for last century. For this century, can we create the type of economics that we need for the survival of the species? Answer, yes, it's possible. I don't know if it will be done. The basis, theoretical and empirical, exist. New markets, new growth theory, new cost-benefit analysis, and new measures of GDP, all of which are changed when you change markets. When I provide a new market, a carbon market, then energy which is becomes all of a sudden less profitable, more undesirable. 
clean energy becomes more profitable and more desirable. And when you look at the GDP of a nation with a carbon market that has more clean energy, that country looks richer. And it, looks make, it, it seems to be making more progress as it is than a, than a nation that has dirty energy. That is the change that the carbon market does. And since everything in the world is produced from energy, it changes all the markets in the world. The energy market is called, for good reasons, the mother of our markets. And the carbon market changes the mother of our markets, seriously. I am expecting to hear a lot of uh, uh, debate from you about the use of markets, so I'm preparing myself. But you know, we'll, we'll deal with that later. And they change the goal of economics. And from my point of view, the new capitalism in the 21st century is really going to change the goal. From short-term short optimization of profits, we're going to go to optimizing progress and ensuring the survival of the human species. That's it. Tonight is somebody I think you all know well, uh, a, uh, somebody who, with the end of nature that was written, I think in 1989, is, th is that right? Uh, 1989, uh, wrote a book that jumped to the attention of people throughout the world. More recently, he wrote a book called Deep Economy, looking at issues of economics and environment. And most recently, he has a new book, Earth with a green A in the middle, a second green A in the middle, making a life uh, on a tough new, new planet. But it's not so much that he's written important and widely read books, but that Bill is a rare person who is not just a thinker and a journalist, but a scholar activist, if I can call him that. Somebody who is deeply engaged not just in thinking, but in living his thoughts, not just in beliefs about the world, but acting out those beliefs and principles as action. He is a true advocate and is as well known for the advocacy and the work he does on behalf of what he thinks is happening to our world. For oh, all of us, most of you, I think, are aware of uh, last year his 350.com uh, work and uh, around the world things that, that happened in trying to get people around the world to understand that after 350 uh, parts per, per million, uh, the CO2 just unbalances. Uh, unbalances the atmosphere. He has Guggenheims, he has honorary degrees, uh, he's just been recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in that sense though, I think in, on his website or in one of the biographies I read, it says Time Magazine called him uh, the planet's best green journalist. Uh, that's sort of, you know, like talking about Toni Morrison as our best black writer. Toni Morrison is a great writer, period. It's not that she's a black writer or a woman's writer. And Bill is not a green journalist. He's a philosopher of the environment, and we don't need to qualify it as a, well, he's, he's, when it comes to environment, he's pretty good, but, but otherwise, you know, not somebody we have to pay much, much attention to. He is, in fact, a deep thinker about our world, and in fact, what he has done is make us understand that the questions of environment that are particularly pertinent today go to the heart of what it means to live as human beings in the 21st century and to sustain life as human beings on this small planet as well. So having him here today, and we've been together in many different places over the years, many different continents, but to have him today here with the Capital Institute, with Demos and at NYU is a great pleasure. Uh, Bill, thanks so much for being here. Look, we're in a difficult place right now, uh, a really difficult place scientifically. Uh, I, I did write the first book about all this 22 years ago, and we knew what we needed to know back then about all of this. You know, We knew that when you burn coal, oil, and gas, you put carbon in the atmosphere, we knew its molecular structure trapped heat. The only thing we didn't know was how fast it was going to pinch, and the story of the intervening 20 years is, is pinching way harder and way faster than we thought it was going to. And hence, we're in... Um, uh, big trouble. I mean, we just came through 2010 as the warmest year on record, and the results are playing for all to see. Uh, they showed a few of them there at the beginning from that uh, nice YouTube that someone just spontaneously created out of an op-ed piece that I wrote a couple weeks ago. Um, the 
connecting, the connecting thread in our civilization between different sets of truths between what we understand, say, about science and what we understand about economics. The connecting thread between them is politics. That's how we decide what we're going to do about things. Okay, And the tough news of those 20 years is that, you know, as spectacularly as the scientific method has worked to let us know what's going on, and in fact, as the economic method has worked not as well, but it hasn't failed entirely. It's begun, as Graciela says, to give us new ideas and new hints about where to go and what we can do. Well, if the scientific method has worked and the economic method is at least trying, the political method has so far failed entirely. Um, you know, look at our Congress. We have a perfect bipartisan 20-year effort to accomplish nothing, and it has succeeded absolutely, and it's getting worse, not better. In 1988, George H.W. Bush, running for president on the Republican ticket, said, I will fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect, which was a pretty good line, actually, and uh, he didn't particularly mean it, but at least he was, you know, uh, now he couldn't be elected, uh, uh, couldn't win the Republican nomination with anything like that kind of uh, stance. Um, here's the, f the real economic truth that explains that political thing and the first thing that we have to get rid of if we're going to move in the direction that Graciela and that John and that Ben suggest that we must, which I completely agree with. The thing that we've got to do is overcome the particular power of the fossil fuel industry. It is the key to all of this. It is by far the most profitable and powerful industry on the planet. ExxonMobil made more money last year than any company in the history of money. And the reason that that's important is because in our political system and many others, even a tiny fraction of that money is enough to warp that political system and stall us from ever doing the kind of things that by now scientists and an increasing number of economists tell us that we need to do. Um, we're never going to we're never going to have in this fight more money than the fossil fuel industry. With clever use of the financial system, we can begin to even those odds a little bit. And that kind of stuff that the uh, John other time about doing is to me very exciting as we start trying to leverage money in that fight. But mostly, we're going to have to find, if we're serious about doing it, a different currency to work in as well. And that other currency is going to be, if it comes from anything at all, it's going to be bodies and spirit and creativity. It's going to require building a political movement strong enough to put up some real challenge to the power of that money. And if we can, then the goal, or at least one of the first goals, is clear. There are very few economists, even at this point, sort of neoclassical economists, who, are, who would make an argument against the idea that uh, carbon should have to pay its way. Okay? Um, um, there's no intellectual reason why the business model for Exxon and everybody else should be what it is, which is essentially we get to use the atmosphere as an open sewer into which to dump our biggest waste product for free. Okay? That's why they're the most profitable business on earth, and it's a completely intellectually in, indefensible business model, but if you're ExxonMobil or a coal company or anything else, you're sure as hell going to defend it, and that's what's going on, and that's why we're not able to make the progress here or almost anywhere else around the world that we need to make. And so building the movement strong enough to break that power is the basic bottom line that we face if we're going to make progress in the short window of time that physics and chemistry allows us. I'm not going to argue to you that that's definitely going to happen. It probably, if you were a betting person, would say that it was unlikely in the time that we have because we've been losing for 20 years and so it's not clear why we're going to win real fast anytime soon. But if you were looking for hope, and I do from time to time, despite the gloomy titles of my books, um, um, 
you could do worse than to look at the work we've done in the last couple of years at 350.org, which has been a kind of beta test for whether or not we can build this sort of movement. And, you know, we've basically done what we've done with no resources at all. We started three years ago after the NASA team led by Jim Hansen put out their paper about 350, put out a paper saying this is the most important number in the world. Any value for carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million is not compatible with the planet on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Okay, That was the most important scientific paper of the millennia and really one of the few organized responses to it was the formation of this group called 350. Org, which at its inception and largely to this day consisted of me, middle-aged and clueless rioter, and seven 22-year-olds at Middlebury College in Vermont. Um, um, the useful thing, of course, was that there were seven of them and there are seven continents, so that mapped nicely, and, <laughs> and they went to work. And within a year, we'd held uh, uh, our first big global day of action, and somewhat surprisingly to us, it managed to coordinate 5,100 demonstrations in 180 countries, what CNN called the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. And then we did it on a bigger scale last year uh, uh, in every country but North Korea. And this fall, there'll be another big one of these sort of global things on September 24th that I hope you all will help with. We're also doing lots of other things, trying to, uh, 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 trying to tarnish the power of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is the biggest fossil fuel front group in this country, uh, on and on and on. But the point is, if we're able, if we're ever able to overcome that power and put a serious price on carbon that reflects the damage it does in the atmosphere, the possibilities for relatively rapid change that would follow thereafter are, I think, very real. I think we would at the very least find out how useful and powerful markets are, okay? And if they, if they were as powerful as we, then the results should be interesting. Um, because so much of the world is built on the foundation of cheap fossil fuel that pretty much everything would begin to change. Our agriculture is the product, our highly industrialized and centralized agriculture, for instance, is the result of the widespread availability of cheap fossil fuel. Were that condition to disappear, then it would start to look a little different. In fact, Maybe that's where I'll end, since it goes back to this question of connections that people have put forward very powerfully. Let's think about food for a minute, because it's the ultimate bottom line for any planet and any person on it. Um, on the one hand, we're entering a period where it's far more going to be far more difficult to grow the food that we need. The rule of thumb among agronomists is at the moment that if you increase the temperature of the planet one degree, you can expect from this point on grain yields to fall 10%. And since the climatologists are pretty convinced that without rapid change in our use of fossil fuel, we'll see an increase in temperature of four or five degrees this century, you can do the math about what that means, and then you can do the work in your own head to try and figure out what a planet with 30 or 40 percent fewer calories will be like. Not good. We can already see it happening, you know, place after place after place as harvests begin to fail and, and weird weather takes place. So that's the downside. But we can begin to see the, the other side, too. Since I've given you a bunch of really uh, uh, hopeless statistics, let me give you a hopeful one. The USDA said last year that for the first time in 150 years, the number of farms in America had increased instead of decreased, okay? which was very interesting. I mean, that's been the most important demographic trend for more than a century in this country, and now it's bottomed and begun to reverse. And the reason is that people have begun to build this local food movement over the last decade. And that's useful for ecological reasons. You know, the five-mile tomato is uh, more ecologically sound than the 2,000-mile one. It's useful for uh, culinary reasons. I traveled 
2,000 miles this week. I know how I feel. That's how the tomato feels also, you know. Um, but most of all, it's sort of useful for, for, I think, for precisely this work of changing the world in the direction that Graciela suggests, away from highly individualistic and towards something else. Farmers markets have been the fastest growing part of the food economy. That's how we've leveraged that growth in local agriculture. And a couple of years ago, a pair of sociologists followed shoppers, first around a supermarket, then around a farmer's market. You all have been to the supermarket. You know how it works. You walk in. You fall into a light fluorescent trance. You visit the stations of the cross <laughs> around the perimeter of the market. That's it. When they followed people around the farmer's market, they found, on average, they were having 10 times more conversations per visit than at the supermarket. All right? Building up again, some of the connections that a highly fossil fuelized world, a, a world where we've spent for 60 years our treasure on basically the American project of building bigger houses farther apart from each other, uh, uh, reversing some of that. And what's interesting about farmers markets is they cut across class and everything else. The biggest users of them in this country are recently arrived immigrants, as it turns out. Um, um, perhaps because they can remember what food actually is supposed to taste like and are unwilling to accept the simulations, you know. But um, that's my phone. <laughs> that's not good. Uh, uh, but the, um, the point is, the point is that we are in trouble now of a new sort. And it's going to take precisely the sort of scale of rethinking that's been described here to get out of it, but that rethinking doesn't happen in a vacuum. The lever for making it real is the lever of politics, and that only works if we participate in serious ways. So if you want to help, go to 350.org, and even if you're just in a kind of sad mood someday about all of this, go there and look at some of the pictures from these, there's about 15,000 in the Flickr account from these demonstrations all over the world. And if nothing else, be assured that people around the planet are putting up a good fight. And many, many of those people, maybe most of them, are doing them in, from places where they haven't caused this problem. You know, um, not their fault. And I think it sort of makes it all the more morally incumbent upon the rest of us to do something. So with that, I will sit down and just say the one other thing I want to say thanks for, and it kind of passed without uh, much uh, notice. The, the news that NYU has cut its yeah. energy use 40% yeah, in right. half a decade is a good sign. Um, you know, it shows what we're capable of if we take these things seriously. The change in markets and in prices is probably what it's going to take to make people take it seriously on a scale that matters. Thank you.